Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to another uh, webinar of the Media Education Lab. Uh, this time, uh, I have the honor to introduce uh, our former visiting scholar, Marketa Nezumkova, who uh, is also an affiliate faculty with the Media Education Lab. And she's going to talk about a very interesting project that um, we've been interesting to hear about because usually when uh, we talk about media literacy, we talk about practices in school or after school in places that got a grant or funding and their population are working um, with certain advantages and resources for that specific project. But um, we're going to hear also about the challenges um, of teaching media literacy um, when there is issues with uh, oppression, with resources, and we'll have a very interesting talk um, after the presentation to see how do we um, go from um, seeing media literacy with the challenges and how can we offer our insight. So, um, Marketa, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm saying hi from Prague. I will share my screen with you and uh, I'll go for a short, uh, hopefully short presentation around 15 to 20 minutes. But if you feel uh, you want to stop me and have a question already, you can, or we can discuss afterwards. So I'll just open it for um, now. And I just muted everybody. So if you want to talk, just unmute yourself so that we won't have background uh, noises. Here we go. Can you see my screen now? Okay, can you see the presentation now? Okay, great. So this is actually a project that um, it was funded by Cost Action. I'll, I'll show you here. It was the Digital Literacy and Multimodal Practices of Young Children. Um, so this is a huge three years grant that is led by Jackie Marsh in the University of Sheffield. But every year they have a short name scientific mission that they award to early career researchers so they can conduct a small scale research for 2000 uh, euros. So I was the, actually the first round of this uh, short term scientific mission when I got this grant and it was last year. And I used it because at the time I was actually moving back to the Czech Republic after doing my PhD and spending seven years in England. So when I returned to the Czech Republic, I um, found very in a way even disturbing the situation of Roma citizens in their country and having been in England and in the US before and learning all about the digital literacy and media literacy projects for different ethnic minorities or cultural minorities or deprived children, I found very interesting that there hasn't been said or researched much about Roma people. And I will not tell you much about the situation in the Czech Republic because actually when I did this research, I only had very uh, narrow understanding of it. So the way I will present what I want to talk about today will be in the same way I kind of did the research. So uh, we will see afterwards if you need some contextual questions around it, you can ask me. So what I did is that I uh, had it very wide. I just wanted to explore the Czech Roma Child's media, uh, child, Roma Child's experience of the model literacy learning. Um, I'll get back to this later. So what I actually did, because it was a small scale research, I normally, those who don't know me, I most of the research I do is primary school children at schools around media literacy and media learning. But this was very different for me because I, um, giving the um, grant that I was awarded to, it was focused on preschool children. And being with the research with Roma children, I didn't have much opportunity to go to kindergartens because most of them um, don't go to kindergartens. And the others, they had go to special centers for maybe focused on Roma children for preschool preparation. So I need to change what I usually do and I had to focus on actually doing research in families or going to these informal preschool centers. So what I did is that I, I had this holistic and phenomenological approach that rather than doing the literature review before and trying to understand everything and come up with the real research questions, like set research questions, I really wanted to put the child and their experience and the family in the center and just go to the family and see what's happening, what is relevant to them and explore anything that is connected to education, childhood and media and learning together. So it was very holistic looking at the whole child and seeing what is relevant, what parts and so on. 
it was phenomenological because the experience was in the center and not my own beliefs about Roma people and Roma children as is normal and common in this research. So I tried to get away from that. Um, I'll show you what I actually did. So at the end, I got into seven families that they were socially excluded. They could be classified in a way socially excluded. This was not my intention, but because I worked with the Open Society Fund and with other in in NGOs, I, of course, got into the families that were uh, of need of their help. So at the end, this was, this was, in a way, the families that I worked with. So it limited the project in a way, but also it helped me to narrow down the focus on actually socially excluded Roma families. And I worked with se seven of them. And they were all in different levels of social exclusion. Some were experiencing residential segregation and many different disadvantages. Some were doing a bit better, having only multiple you know, disadvantages, which is quite good in the Czech Republic if you have only few, not many of them. Uh, so um, this research was in a way a bit new for me also that I had to be very flexible. I used multiple methods because I worked with the family, the parents, but also mainly the children. I tried to work a lot with the children. But given that it was preschool and um, it was in their homes and sometimes in the informal settings, and I was really not in a power of deciding that every time it was the parents who decided everything. So I actually did very different things with different children and, and I spent different amount of time in different families. So that's why I created this table that helps to understand that I actually, what I did, I tried to interview the parents. It happened, it was always the mother then I either did observations at home, home or at school center or both. Um, then with the children, I uh, tried to do some short, brief interviews. Uh, when possible, they gave me guided tours around the center or around their home and so on. And really, as with some parents, I did one interview with some, I did four or five. And it really was just whatever you, whatever is possibility, I'll just take it and I'll do it but I'll see what comes out out of it. So it was a very new form of research for me as well. Um, so when I say that I did the holistic research, looking at the hall and seeing what is relevant, so I really didn't know what afterwards I will find is relevant. And I wrote a research report after just uh, immediately after my field research last year and Rena actually read it. But it was, it was a research report and just summarized all different themes and coding I did and things about children's media and learning and all that. But what I actually want to talk about today is my latest thinking around the theme because I'm still working with the field, the research that I did, but looking for it in different ways. Because in the beginning, when I finished the research, I thought I would be really thinking about what to say. And when I started saying things, I realized it's not about what I'm saying, but about how I'm saying it. So suddenly I entered into a whole new field of, I used to be very careful about how I talk about children because that was my field, but how I talk about minority children and Roma minority children, that became really complicated. And when I went to conferences, everyone was really supportive and very interested in the topic, but also very critical about, let's be careful about how we talk, how we talk about ourselves, how we talk about the others. And I suddenly realized that this especially when it comes to Roma and in Europe, it becomes a very complicated topic. So one of the things that my latest thinking after about, I spent many months about how I think about the topic, I actually got to the idea that right now I'm writing a book chapter for Nordicom for the uh, edition Digital Parenting. Uh, so this is how I got into the idea of parental ethno theories. So this is also a new concept for me, and this is the week that I'm actually writing the book chapter, so this is great for me to get some feedback and some ideas from you as well, because um, this topic, I think, is much closer to many of you than it's actually to me. So with the parental ethno theories, it's a um, concept that I found while trying to understand the research that I conducted. And as I found it, it could be understood as cultural belief system or cultural models served by the parents from a culture group. Okay, I mean, of course, this is, uh, this is difficult because many people would say Roma is not a culture, it's ethnicity, and it's very hard something to classify. But in general, I found it a very interesting concept that I think has not been researched much in context of media literacy or digital literacy, and also in parental mediation and digital parenting, which is actually the topic of the book. So, so looking at that, I found that this was actually from social anthropology from the 1986 when Harkness and Super uh, came out with this concept as part of their developmental niche framework 
when they were trying to understand the cultural influence uh, and influences that um, they have impact on the child's development and learning. And they came up with the three systems that are important in cultural upbringing, which is the physical and social settings. So the physical being, for example, in what environment, if it's home, school, how it looks like there, the social settings, who is educating, who is raising me, in what ways, and so on. The caregiving customs and practices, for example, how much obligations. So it's really much more the practical side. But the last one, the third one, is about parental ethnotheory, so the cultural beliefs. And later in their research, for example, 1996 and repeatedly in 2000s, they came back to parental theories and defined them as the most crucial ones in all the system they developed because they actually influence everything else. They influence the way we raise the children, in what settings, do we send them at school, how we approach their participation in school, and so on. So I started to exploring these parental theories and the research, different research papers around it, and for example, with Indian parents who moved to USA, I haven't found none really about Roma parents, so that I found very interesting. Why is not there any about, at least I haven't found it so far, but I'm in the process. So, um, so the thing about the, what, when I was trying to understand some of the things that could be considered as cultural, because this is also a difficult thing sometimes, having a, that I work with disadvantaged children, sometimes it's hard to divide the, what is a socioeconomic situation and the way that the parenting is connected to that. And I could find some similarities, in, uh, for example, in Amicruel Childhood, in the Laura book from 2013. But some of the things could be really considered cultural. So when I was researching, I came across this term Romani pen, which um, in the Czech uh, literature, it's considered as something as a totality of what it means to be Roma, and that it's something that is really hard to grasp because it's just part of the of their way they live, but something that is hard for us sometimes to understand or define even for themselves. So we know that it's something, but it's hard for us to really say what. So some people, some uh, some other literature actually talks about it. That uh, when I look at the summaries, they say it's a Roma spirit, the essence of Roma, Roma laws, Roma willingness and desire to follow the awareness of belonging to the Roma community. So maybe it's very much about the feeling, if I belong somewhere, how I feel, rather than a set of strict rules. Um, so one of the important things to my research was that those with no Romani pen are called gajo, gajo, gaji, so non-Roma people. And if you are Roma by ethnicity, it doesn't mean you have Romani pen. You can still be called gaje, gaji, because you don't feel, your, you don't feel that spirit. Yeah, or someone has the feeling that you don't feel the spirit. So that if you are a Roma person in the Czech Republic, this is something that you come across a lot, and your parental ethnography is the cultural belief becoming this tension. One is the Roman pen, and one is the dominant Y uh, culture here. So, and so this is a lot of rhetoric around who is Gajo, who is Roma or Gypsy. So the things that about uh, parenting that I was looking at it uh, from the families, I saw that from the Romani pen and in my research and things that was written about it, that the Romani pen way of parenting and parental asthma theories are connected to natural growth parenting that Laura wrote about her book. This again, it was more connected to socioeconomic situations in the USA, but some of the things of believing that the adulthood is something that happens and that children are free to explore and go into it without much uh, ordering the children and so on. The difference that I found is that in the natural growth parenting, they talk about that they give orders, they don't discuss so much. But here in the Roma uh, communities I work with in the families, they didn't really give uh, orders. It was more about um, you cannot do things rather than you must do things. So like you cannot go and talk badly to your grandfather, but you don't have to go to wash your hands, for example. So that was a bit different rhetoric, at least in the families that I worked with. So that was something they actually, for the neo Romani pen, you don't force your children. You just sometimes tell them not to do something, but otherwise you don't force your children to do anything, even go to school if it's possible that they don't have to go. So the other thing was that, of course, uh, part of the Romani pen is the extended family is the main and most respected and autotherapy unit. So there's something that actually not school, uh, not teachers, not the system, not the government, but really the family is the most important. And they, they are above the law, so basically above anything. So what they say, this is what it belongs to. But this is kind of just a very 
narrow way, but still the most one that I could most possible to grasp about Brahman even. But so normally I would think that once I understand this, I would know how it influenced the way the approach to understanding the role of digital media and technology in children's life. But when I actually did this research and I tried to look at it more in a way that, okay, let's look at it more deeply, I realized there is another issue that I'm dealing with that I found quite interesting. So the thing that it really they have a shared cultural experience was that they always had two competing cultural models. So as the Roma community, they don't have their own state. They actually don't have a country that they can refer to, that this is where our culture is, though this is where we speak the language. There are always other competing models, and the Roma people, always the minority, they, they are always the ones that have to compete and have to negotiate what is my kind of understanding and parental beliefs about the children, the childhood, about raising up, about parenting, and what are the dominant ones that I'm living with. And this is something that they always have as a shared experience. I found actually in their parental theories, it's not so much about Romanipan as it is about negotiating Romanipan with the dominant cultural models and how it influences the way of my parenting. And now, although it wasn't um, case study research, I have three families that I took out from the seven that are representing some ideas that I would like to share with you. Uh, again, I will not go much into the detail. Let me see what time is it. I'll spend like three more, five more minutes, and then we can discuss. So I wrote the quotes here, and I will share the presentation with you later on if you want. I will not read them much, but I want to show you these three families. Okay, so this family is uh, family number three, later on if you want to go back to the table. And this is Elena, and she has a girl, six-year-old, and boy, seven-year-old. Um, let me just see, I have it here. So, um, Elena was actually a client at one of the NGOs that I researched with, where they gave me the context to the families. But now she worked as a social worker in a preschool club for children. Uh, actually, his story was, her story was about that they were both working parents and she worked in the segregated community. But when she started working with the NGO, she decided she would like to move out of the community and give their children different chances. So when she started actually doing it, she had difficulties to find a flat. So, uh, but luckily, the NGO helped her, helped her, so she moved out of the community. But then what was very interesting, because she started telling me that uh, for two, three years during this transition, I did not belong anywhere. There was nowhere I was accepted, except by the people of the organization. So suddenly she faced the idea that she wasn't accepted by the Roma community anymore. They started calling her Gajo because she moved out of their community and she didn't share the, the values they believe. But at the same time, she wasn't accepted by the minority because she was still Roma. Although she moved in the city center, she was very well behaved citizens and so on. So actually, when I talked to her very often, whatever I was asking about, about, the, about the raising, the education, the media and everything, she very often talked about actually framing it in a way I'm not like the Roma people because I actually force my children to do something. Or, or she said, uh, I don't teach my children Romani language because it will not help them with anything. So it, it's something useless. It's better to teach them English or something that will help them in the future. Um, so she said, uh, I don't, my kids even don't know what gypsy is. If they hear it somewhere, I'll explain it to them, but I owe them knowing they are every, the same as everyone else. So we are actually talking about, I mean, it sounds in a way that very dream for many integrational policies, but in a way this is really hardcore assimilation that actually everything that is there is considered kind of even for themselves kind of useless. And they are actually trying to position themselves. We are as everyone else. We are not different. We are not unique. We are just as everyone else. Um, so when it came to media, she really said in a way, I have never really thought about it. It's just the pause in between their duties when they do their homework, something they can rest from. Okay, so she, she was not yet thought that actually white people or someone that she, they considered as maybe digital literacy or something that is the way that she could be even more part of the society. It was just something, a break from the duties. Okay, so that was, I don't know. The other family, I'm giving in an example of some family that actually told me, well, we know that whatever we do, we will not be accepted by the majority. So we just continue being, uh, living according to our Roma beliefs and 
so should they really see it as this, this is how we live and this is how we live and we cannot change it anything there is no way there was a bit different in our lives or so why we should even try so we will just do, live the way we see as ours uh, because they otherwise they would have to completely change their mind this was a family that lived in a suburban house which was a kind of Roma area but not that much it wasn't a ghetto or in a segregated area and they had actually seven children from ranging from 10 to eight months. Uh, sorry, I don't have more pictures here because I couldn't find them on my disc, but I have many pictures from this family. It was a very nice family. But it was very interesting that, um, I'm sorry, I just found my... Okay, so, so for example, here she already says in this family, her, the main goal of the mother was to, uh, for the children to scrape through the elementary school, but she wouldn't force them to anything because it's not part of how they are, that they would be forcing their children to anything. They love them, but this is just not the way they raise their children. Um, but the, when we actually talked about the media, they, see, they saw it, and in turn, especially internet, digital media, like computer, they saw it as something very important nowadays for life. Just for ordinary things, I want to buy something or I need to... Um, get something from uh, anything, just ordinarily life today things, they needed internet. So they really talked about connection. Uh, when they had digital media and some tablets, they said we have rules for the children so they just don't uh, argue. So they had 10 minutes rule between seven children so each of them could play a certain amount of time. But when she actually talked about the children, she didn't see, again, the media was for her, really with just children interest. So if they like cooking games, she was highly they like cooking games. For the boy, it was a way so he would behave quiet for a while. So every child, she had a different approach. It was just a tool, something they used. The very tool for specific. And then the last one I want to talk about for me was actually the most interesting and one that made me think the most about my own understanding of the middle class white person in the Czech Republic and the research that I've been reading so far was that in this family, I had the feeling that Everything was really about the children. This, this family lived in one of, one of the, what is considered one of the worst uh, Roma ghettos in the city. Again, considered by the white people. I don't know if, because Helena, the mother, Alena, Helena, Helena never really talked about the situation because she never really, when I talked to her, mentioned white and Roma. Every time I asked her about something, she was just talking about her children all the time and putting really the children in the center. And it was very interesting for me because she, she said, yes, I want my children to be well behaved. But then everything that I asked was asking, it was, okay, I do this if my children want and it did interest them. But it was interesting because she was the only one who actually read to their children like, very constantly. She said it helps them and they love it. They actually asked for it. If they didn't ask for the reading the books, she wouldn't do it. But because they're asking, she was doing it. Then was talking about, yes, we, we like to give them all the tablets and mobile phones when we have money because they actually behave better with these technologies than they would with toys that they would just break them. So we want to do it, but it depends on the money. So she agreed with her mother that she will buy a computer for the kids because she has more money and so on. So um, she talked about, for example, that in the future she wants her boy to have access to internet because she can, he can learn there and because books are very expensive, but internet is not that expensive. So actually there's something they can learn from. So, but when I, it's not something that she was thinking so much about he can learn to become this or that. When she talked about him that he can learn, it was actually because when I talked to the boy, he told me that he likes learning that he actually doesn't like school because boys are fighting there because he went to the main in Roma school. And he said, I don't like it because boys are fighting, but I actually do love the education. I love the curriculum. And other, girl, other girls as well talk to me about like, I want to go to school, which is something that actually you might find is normal. But when I talked to some of the children, it was very difficult to ask them about schools or learning or what do you want to do in the future? Because these questions, no one ever, at least in my point of view, it was hard to get any answer from them from this. But these children were actually... They, they were really naturally interested in learning and she was naturally trying to help them and she needed internet and media and technologies to support this and she struggled with the access. So my conclusion here is that of course there are many things to talk about and I took it very briefly but I think that of course the access to this technology and to the internet truly is an issue relevant to their lives because they really talked about it was relevant to them so well done for those who talk about access. But then Children, sometimes um, we think that the children's well-being is not at the core of their of Roma people's life because they don't force them to education. Uh, maybe they have different approaches to parenting. 
But in reality, when I did the research, the well-being of students was really at the core, but maybe not the well-being that a middle-class white researcher would construct for themselves. It was a different kind of uh, well-being that I still don't grasp fully, but it's something that is important to look at because it was at the core, the child's well-being in the Roma family that I worked with. And then the last part that is uh, the big part of my book chapter that I'm looking at it now is that kind of when I was doing all this, I realized that these question that the Roma families have to ask about the choosing between Roma Nipen and the white culture belief because of all these integration and assimilation policies and situations and historical background in the Czech Republic is actually doesn't really serve their own need and wants. So I'm looking at digital media literacy that shows the diverse needs and wants of diverse Roma individual and families, not for the white people's integration or assimilation rhetoric practices and politics. Because a lot of the a lot of rhetoric on digital literacy and media literacy is yes, we need it to bring to the Roma community so they can integrate more. So again, it's about integration, it's about what we want rather than what they really need and how can we support what are they doing and how can we help with them. And then I have two more questions for later on, but I can stop here. Great. Wow, thank you very, very much. That's very enlightening and uh yeah. Um, so I, what I appreciate about, first of all, is as you said, I didn't know, not understanding the Czech um, context, I didn't have zero understanding of what Roma people meant. Um, and then really, as you walk me through, I'm understanding more and more and, and understanding the context. And it sounded like it was like the process that you went by it. So my first question, and then, you know, we'll open it for other people. What I was missing is, is there even any media literacy practices there or there's none? Just to understand when you say that there is a different media literacy from the middle class in the Czech Republic, is there any even programs or something that you relate or how is the situation with media literacy there to understand your research? Yes, so, so far I haven't found any, um, in, any after-school programs or anything specific for Roma children and Roma youth. And what we have in the Czech Republic as the part of the national curricula, you are actually, uh, we have the cross-curricular theme of media education and every primary and secondary and high school are actually obliged to teach media education. But of course it's not happening that much even in, uh, in schools where they are in different different areas, but school serving actually these children possibly even much less. And currently there is no research into it, but I've actually submitted a research grant in March and I'm waiting until December to hear about if I will get the research grant, which is called, which is for three years and it's about media literacy in life and education of socially excluded children. So it's not only Roma, but also poor children which are socially excluded. So that would be the first research into this here. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, I haven't got it at all. I don't think I will, but... <laughs> well, it's a start, you know. We're young scholars. Uh, yeah. Uh, somebody that I know says we need to kiss uh, five frogs until we're getting our prints, so... I'm using it all it's the time. Right <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So, I want to open it because we have really um, a lot of uh, different people here on the webinar that have really unique experiences uh, with media literacy that I'm sure each one with your own context, you can contribute to questions and kind of have a very interesting discussion about, about this. So whoever wants to, to ask a question or to give a comment, you're welcome. Remember you're muted, so you need to unmute yourself to, uh, to talk. So I have a question for you. Um... Could you tell me a little bit more about the ways that the children were using the internet? So Yanti was asking about the media literacy component and you talked about the importance of the internet to the families. How were I'm sorry, the internet I... when you saw it? Was my me frozen? I, I lost you for one second. No, sorry. Jen, you were broken. So can you explain again your questions? How did the children use the, inter the internet? Yes, I was just curious to find out a little more about that. So you mentioned the importance of the internet to the families, yeah. and Yanti was asking about the media literacy component, uh, but I wondered what, what kinds of actions or, or activities did you observe them enacting when they were on the internet? 
Okay, so um, again, it's just focused on the families that I actually worked with. So except the family that I talked about, it was trying to really fit in and moved out of the community and that. So they, they had very different. So they, in a way, they had a limited time and on the internet, they were mostly just watching something, doing games, but for a very brief time. And I didn't have much chance to actually observe them very carefully, but it was mainly just watching their favorite shows or playing their favorite games. In the other families, um, a lot of the children were preschool. So what they would do, for example, is that they would watch a lot of YouTube videos themselves. And there was a family that the boy, he was three years old and he spent most of the time watching and unboxing videos. But when I talk about a natural growth parenting, it, it was very funny because actually this, this I did one of my uh, stories that I like is when he was watching the unboxing, he was three or four years old videos and I was watching with him, the mother came and she was like, and tell, she was calling me the Miss Teacher, tell the Miss Teacher, what else do you like on the YouTube? And he was like, no, no, I will not say it. She was like, no, 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 tell her, tell her. And then the mother says, he likes shaking butts on the internet. <laughs> so then he, sometimes when he was unboxing, then it changes to dancers and shaking the butt. And she was very, she thought it's, it's hilarious. And she didn't have these like, and for me, was like, whoa. And then I laughed, started laughing myself because it was again the, you know, the contradictions between, oh my God, let's protect the children. And then this natural growth that is happening in the families uh, in the normal world, it's happening in the online world as well. It's the world that the children are free to explore as much as they want. So that was you, whatever you do, games, uh, then I uh, chatting, all these things. But the thing, interesting thing about the internet was that it didn't expand their circles. Yeah, I'm sorry, I guess you're frozen. I don't know if you hear me. Yeah, okay. Um, so most of the Roma, even, even the parents and young people I worked with had mainly Roma people on their social networks. And actually this is one of the main issues in the Czech Republic that we say that we, be, there's barely any Roma family that would, a child that would ever actually went to white people's household or the white child who would go to Roma people's household. And this really replicates itself online at least in what I've researched so far, so. Wow, um, thank you so much. So that actually sets up my question really nicely. Um, Cause I guess since throughout your talk, I found myself thinking about this, first of all, this really interesting irony that the Gaja are a minority of a minority, right? Mm -hmm. So the Roma are a minority and the Gaja, because they're kind of don't fit, they're a minority of a minority. So they are the most, marginal right because they're ambivalent between the worlds that is fascinating to me but I, it started making me think a little bit about like what are our values about assimilation and integration because you said media literacy should serve the needs of the roma people not the assimilationist agenda but at the same time um because the internet is not expanding their social circles because roma and white people will not visit each other's houses or babysit each other's families or have dinner together, then there is kind of no real alternative to break the stereotypes that truly limit human freedom. Because you met a lot of bright and talented children who probably had a whole lot to offer the world, but those children will never get the chance to contribute to a wider world because they'll be marginalized inside their social circle. And is that really fair to them? Yeah. So, so I wonder about, you know, there's a reason why we think assimilation is a good thing. <laughs> because it permits true autonomy on the part of the human person. Mm -hmm. Maybe. What's your yeah. thought? I think the difficult part about the assimilation, as I talked about it in the Czech Republic, is that there was there has been for decades the idea that don't teach romani language because it's useless it will help, actually make the children to do worse at school uh, you know that that really the idea that anything connected to roma is useless or that you should be ashamed of is very strong rhetoric in the czech republic so i think that this is um this is very cultural assimilation, I would say, rather than social and economic. So I think, um, so I've been exploring and thinking about the idea of cultural rights 
of Roma children as well, because there has been a lot about civil civil rights and other rights of Roma children, but actually cultural rights, I think, are the ones that no, are not really explored much. But the thing that when you talked about it, that actually my idea, and, and this is also something that is not part of this book chapter, but for the long term, I'm, I'm really thinking very hard about is the agency and the civic imagination, as Jenkins writes about it, in the context of Roma children, because I told you it was hard for me sometimes to ask them about how do you see your future or how do you see your life, what would you change? And this is very difficult to discuss and communicate, even with the parents. Even when I tried really hard to talk about media and the role and, you know, they, they show you as criminals on media, would you say, well, it's just how it is, you know, like we wouldn't change it. It, it doesn't, it, so it was very, so I think that what I found that, that it's such a, such a deep problem that first of all, they, we have to learn about each other from both sides and get much better understanding of each other. So that's one thing. And the other thing is really help maybe the media literacy, media education at the first place have to somehow I was that's my question can actually media literacy and digital literacy help these children to find their agency and help them with civic imagination especially that, given if fatalism is so built into the cultural fabric it's fatalism yeah. is the opposite of agency right yeah whoa so I is, want, sorry if, no, I'm sorry just the rhetoric that if you if you just it's just so used to that everything Roma is useless and to be ashamed of, it is actually really hard to turn it around and how you want the children to make fight for it, <laughs> you know, like because if you see a country where people speak your language and they live their culture, you might say, well, this is where I want to live or I want this here where I live, but they don't even most of the time don't have where to look. But but it seems to me it's kind of like it would be easy to sort of say. Here's the world that's depicted on TV, right? Mm -hmm. You're watching a lot of TV, right? Here's the world that's depicted on TV, and here's your, where, how you live. What's similar, what's different, mm -hmm. right? So the, the kids have to be picking up on, they're learning from that entertainment TV, right? That there's some other world where people act differently, right? I wonder, I wonder. Yeah, uh, when I, yeah, no, no. I, I tried I tried this with parents and what happened to me is for example this uh, positive role model so I, I thought about this American style you know like let's bring black cups and, <laughs> and white cups uh, and but when I talked to them they told me well maybe they would have white people to change their perception about us but not us about ourselves because that is already someone got job that's not someone who has Roman Ipan values so we won't identify with that person Right. I mean, again, that was adults. So maybe if we work with children and young people, that's why I, so I really would like to get a grant because I also this was very preschool children and parents, but maybe somewhere at the youth, you know, or a bit in between, there, there is something that I haven't uh, had a chance to work with yet. But with the parents, it was very difficult because they would say, we would just think it's a good job. So I want to, to add to the conversation kind of, um, I have issues with the word um, assimilation and it might be my issues with English that I don't understand it. But for me, assimilation means that you assimilate your uniqueness into the greater dominant culture. And then it's just one-sided. Um, the way that I look at the, I think what Marquetta is talking about is more multiculturalism and um, intercultural kind of um, communication where you value both sides and you have a real dialogue and that wouldn't be assimilation. Uh, I feel assimilation is a very powerful oppressive kind of way and to I'm answer... Sorry, just, yeah, sorry. No, no, but... no, you're right and that's why I think I was, um, I'm sure I didn't make it clear but you're helping me now. <laughs> As I guess assimilation I think is actually what is happening although they call it integration in the Czech Republic but it is still a much more stronger assimilation at least in the families that I worked with and yes what I'm talking about and what I'm thinking is much more about yes the integration but not integration in a way but rather the multi multiculturalism like how can we be two unique cultures understanding each other and living together and right now it's so much about integration of Roma or assimilation and then calling it integration 
in Roma people, but not let's learn about each other. So there is nothing about Roma history, Roma language at schools, anything. Sorry, and carry on, Jonti. No, so just because I want others to contribute to the discussion, so just the way that I was introduced to media literacy and the way that I'm so into media production is because um, going back 20 years ago, I started working with Jews and Arabs in Jaffa, which obviously that in Israel, the, the Jews are the dominant that are taking over the culture, and there's not a lot of places for the Arab minority to uh, express themselves. And the project was that they, for a year, worked on making videos together, and that was during the like really most violent time in Israel. And making the video together, not each one by themselves, but making it together as um, like socializing together, making messages, talking about it. What do I think about you? What do you think about me? Made them be more appreciative and understanding the human side of each one and what are the similar things and different things of each one, the uniqueness, but also the commonplace. So I feel, again, with my biases, because I'm totally about thinking that media production is going to save the world, is those kind of projects, uh, doing those kind of things, that's the real way of having a dialogue, of really looking eye into eye. And I was just talking today, the fact that I was not the only instructor. I had a co-instructor who was Arab. So we, as the co-instructor, were modeling to the youth that we worked with that there is a coexistence and we are coming from an equal like way, though in society it's very different. Um, yeah, this is, this is great because uh, I found it very interesting and that's what I'm trying to do is looking at inspirations and different projects that work around the similar, although it was not Roma communities, but dealing with similar issues. And actually, I also applied for another research grant that I will, for three years, that I will hear about in March, uh, which is about multicultural education of child prosumers. And it is focused on something that you are saying, actually, of child prosumers looking at in production, as well as the conception of media and going not only with uh, white and Roma, but also the Vietnamese, Eastern European and other minorities at schools in the Czech Republic. So that project is much more practice orientated and it, it brings the production. But so far, if we haven't decided if we get a grant, what kind of the production side will be, if it will be video making, or I was actually considering, and maybe you can tell me what you think, to do a campaign, cross-platform civic campaign together about some issues about connected to a multicultural understanding in the Czech Republic. Cool. So Kelsey can tell you a lot about the work we did with the foster kids in Rhode Island doing yeah, digital right. campaign for three years. So, yeah. Uh, Kate, with your expertise in dealing with the uh, marginalized populations, I'm just dying to hear what you're thinking about uh, in responding to Marquetta. Can you share your thoughts with us? Oh, I'm just taking it all in at this point. Um, I, I recognize, Marquetta, a, a lot of your observations are in line with my work. Um, what Renee is referring to is that I was previously in Sri Lanka working with Sinhalese and Tamil youth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and trying to, to research their usage of social media. And this was already back a few years ago, but especially the way they consume um, YouTube videos seems to be very much in line still with what you're describing, even down to, it reminds me particularly of one boy who he just liked watching videos of fat kids dancing. <laughs> Let alone, it reminds me of the shaking of butts. <laughs> um, one little question that I have that didn't come up, and it sounds like they're watching TV, media, YouTube video, YouTube video media, what's the main point of access for the internet? Or is it traditional computers and television screen monitors or? Or is it the cell phone? Mm -hmm. yeah, so what I experienced in the Rama family is that, that every family is what would be called a TV wall. Like that is very important that what it used to be this family uh, or the gathering around TV and uh, that was is disappearing from kind of our culture. Um, that was still very, and every family had it, no matter how the socioeconomic situation was. So the TV was very important and they consumed different shows and everything. And uh, it was the main problem, it was in every family. And the TV usually disappeared, didn't disappear. 
The other uh, technologies like um, touchpads and smartphones and smartphones most of the time stayed for the parents, for the kids, but the uh, smartphone for kids and the touchpads that was depending on the immediate situation. So most what was happening a lot of the families was that when there were money, they had it for a few days a month, but then for the rest of the money, it was in the pound shop. Um, so that was very dependent on that. The computer uh, was, that's really hard to say. In some families it was, some it was new, some it was all. Um, that was not, yes, the kids themselves had the access more at school or at the library. So the libraries were very important. But again, they, they had issues with the libraries as well. I heard about the, the library, the city I did research at. Well, the library they opened this technological center with playstations and internet and, and computers and everything and it was all the time full of Roma children so instead of ha having some support there for the Roma children had, seeing it as a good good place to do any project they actually took it away so they wouldn't have to deal with the Roma children so, uh, so and they complained about it that they were too loud and then oh you know, my it, God. <laughs> So, um, so there was some, I mean, then they, of course, that I think that there were some complaints and projects around it. So they, they started to seeing a library as an important touch point. But I look at it last year, so far I haven't really seen any projects around it. But I did think that the library might be a good touch point for the children. But again, this is the practical. So, um, so far, it's, I think that this is for me, um, I guess you, you guys are much more experienced in this field. but. For me, when I'm trying to do this now, I really start with the research a lot and really go through the child's experience and parents' experience and slowly for in years move to something practical. But I don't want to hurry up and do it because I'm worried I would just take all of my beliefs and prejudice and my agendas just to go to do it immediately. So I'm, I just need a few years. You know, it's so interesting yeah. that you say that, uh, Marquetta, because I have having talked to you about this your project about one year ago i can already see the way that you are decentering from this in order to recognize the complexity of like how your cultural biases are shaping what you're able to notice care about pay attention to and how you're gaining awareness of that how that bias shapes the nature of your research and i think it's a really cool idea i personally think the parental ethno it's a terrible word right <laughs> ethno theories it's not a great word but i really love the way you framed this up as cultural beliefs that parents bring into raising children that have to do with everything about learning and language and interaction and freedom and all those ideas are so transmitted through parenting Right? We, that's how we define being a good parent. It's like how our parents were. So to me, it's really fascinating. This one group of people who, for some complicated reason, who chose to step away from Romani Pen and their motivations and that choice. Wow. I think that's worth time to investigate. So I think it's good that you're, like you said, you're taking it slow to really understand the complexity of it. So maybe if you others can share your experience with it, if you research some other cultures that are not your own, you haven't had a good knowledge about, so how you went around it. Like, I have a story about it. Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, we interviewed uh, 50 um, Latino families in North Philadelphia. Um, we recruited this a group of people through the uh, church in the neighborhood and the cultural organization in the neighborhood. Uh, at the time, I was really interested in this question about how well people understood public service announcements, which, as you guys all know, is a beneficial form of propaganda. <laughs> right? Depending and, to who. <laughs> yeah, depending to who. So we went in and we, we showed, it's terrible to say this, but we showed public service announcements that were produced by the smoking, by the tobacco industry which were highly biased public service announcements. And we discovered that um, uh, people with, without formal education 
uh, are not really good at asking questions like, who's the author and what's the purpose? Those questions are absolutely uh, elusive. And quite a large number of uh, people in the study misunderstood the purpose because they didn't, uh, because their understanding of who made the ad and what the motive was, was fuzzy. Um, but I'd say the challenge for us was we had to do the interviews in Spanish, and I know there was a lot of slippage there. Uh, the video wall, it was hard to do the interview because they never turned the TV off, right? So there you are in the living room, and the, you know, you're, it's a tiny little place, right? And the giant, giant wall of media is screaming at you, and you're trying to have a serious conversation. I was like, I don't know. It's not easy. <laughs> So I wonder if um, Honyang or Hajar, if you have any uh, questions or comments um, for Marquetta. And um, because turn your microphone on, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so this is the scaring for me. Like people, like kids have freedom not to go to school. This is just like, I, 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 like I strongly recommend that school education is good for any kids. You know, like my son is six years old and he's in public school in Newport, in, in, in the States. And we, can, we know that he can learn a lot from school. So in your region, kids have freedom not to go to school. So this is just scary for me. And I think, um, I, and, I, and I, I'm, I wonder, um, are they using technology or screen as a way of killing time? Or are they using them as an education purpose? Because there are a lot of stuff that is not okay for kids to say, like from YouTube or from like, there are, you have no restrictions maybe like, um, what kids can say. If they don't use it for educational purpose, they can see anything on the TV. That is not okay for kids, like for preschool kids or for like elementary school kids. They don't have like critical thinking skills about what to say, what is proper, what is good for them. So I think this is, um, for me, it sounds scary. So like the kids use media or screen as education. Maybe they, they do not. Maybe they are ad, addictive to it. So what is going to happen if they are addicted to screen? Okay, so, so, so the first thing is, of course, the kids have to go to school, the elementary school in the Czech Republic, because we have laws that uh, may have the obligatory education until uh, you're 15 years of age. Some days they drop out around 14, and, um, but that's already that they don't make such a, but of course the first few years they, they're supposed to go to school, but it is, uh, in some families it works, in some families there's social workers who have to take care of it, who have to come and take the kids and force the family to do it. It's not that it, that it would be in a way, I mean, when I said force them, it's not that every single day you have to go to school. Sometimes you just stay at home and cook with me, you know, nothing happens if you don't go to school today or, so it's in a way that it's just not something that we would, they would, I mean, I don't want to say they would, because again, it was just small research, few families. So in the families that I worked with, it's just something that not always is uh, education treated as in a way that we would every single day you have to go to school unless you are sick or we are going for holidays. Um, and the other question that you said about the, the media, to be honest, they, they haven't, I mean, they, they, it was not a huge excess of media that I saw in a way on my point of view. Okay. Because they, they actually really did a lot of different things and there was a family involved. They would play a lot outside or with their cousins and siblings and they would draw and they would run around. And yeah, it was wild at times. They would took my camera and take pictures and they would love it and they would do many different things. And of course, but they, they also watch TV. So it was very, in a way it was very diverse and whatever they access to, they wanted to use, they wanted to enjoy. And, Yes, there was not a parental control, but again, I love the way that you were shocked because I think that that's a good thing to actually start with. So why do I feel this way? Why am I shocked? And why do I believe that my point of view is actually, you know, 
what, maybe not the best one, but what's good about mine in my point of view and what's maybe good about theirs that I could learn from them. Maybe give us some freedom to my children. <laughs> maybe that could help them in some ways as well. Wow. Mind blown. So um, we're like at the end of the, the hour. So I want to thank really Marketa. This is like amazing. And as I can understand and, and really hope this is just the beginning. So with the grants that again, remember you'll get an, at the end. Um, this is really an important thing that is uh, beyond the Czech Republic because I think in every society uh, we can see that there are like, people that would uh, benefit from this research and understanding and really as we in the media literacy community want to talk about multiple perspective and uh, really appreciate each person's point of view, I think it's really an important uh, research that you're working on. Um, so really I want to thank you and of course as usual we're continuing our conversation through the other webinars and uh, and through also uh, contacting Marketa whoever wants to contact you have the contact info um, in the recording that will be uh, added later on so thank, thank you everyone for having me it was great <laughs>